Um, all right, good afternoon, everyone. This is our, our final uh, panel discussion uh, on what, what has been a, I would say, a very enlightening day. I, I, would, I haven't personally had a lot of chance or understanding of scholarship on urban studies. In fact, most of uh, our own work has been based on ethnographic research, but be able to kind of see what's happening in the field and then take it back. Uh, but what, what has been fantastic has been the, firm, the first panel itself, our discussion around migration, which brought, um, I would say, three very unique perspectives. Uh, Professor Marutra's pre pre uh, discussion was talking on the nature, on how migration has, has happened as a uh, sociological phenomena in a certain way of sorts, or as an economic phenomena in the last uh, two, two, two to three decades. The, the uh, uh, Baishali's own, uh, uh, I think, thesis helped substantiate the claims that, that Professor Marutra had made. I think she provided what we could see as the evidence to the claims he was making. And I think that was very important. And Akriti's uh, follow-up to that was, was helping us understand, giving a more microcosmic understanding of what was happening. So going into the second panel, uh, the, the idea on issue of land, and I think this was something which... Um, Professor Laknath in, in one of our previous discussions mentioned about the context and the context <coughs> to the context. I think the second panel which had was encircled a lot of discussion in the context of land and its changing and use of land use from climate change. But then there is a context to that context as well. That's the politics of development, politics of redevelopment and how that changes uh, and causes most of these um, aspects to change, whether it's in areas of forestry or governance. So uh, with that, I think the idea of our third panel was to be able to understand what we may see as uh, essential features that are changing or causing um, a, a perceptive uh, change in urban dynamics. And uh, Mara's own work, which has been uh, focused in Brazil, has been focused in, within uh, the context of the informal economy. Uh, her work, from what I understand, has been predominantly concentrated on the street vending community. At the same time, she's looked at how uh, different migrants who've come into spaces within the city of Brazil have, ha have been received, A, and second, how is their perception of the local dynamics changed. Uh, Laknath's own work as the way we, we had uh, a discussion uh, which would focus more on looking at the shift in gender norms um, on uh, in Australia and their impact on anthropogenic and consumer behavior. Um, this is, I, I personally feel it's a very interesting subject to look at because now for those who are in the business uh, school and market uh, teams tend to often understand what's really guiding consumer behavior over a period of time. But these are part of very close end studies. They're not really out in the open where you have a dialogue with those who are working in spaces in development scholarship. So I'm very glad that we, we could have him part of it. Professor Kaveri, who is uh, uh, going to be talking about working futures. Um, I think that's uh, uh, an extension of what I think Akriti initially kind of started touching upon, the digital economy. Uh, and Sham's work, who has been working in Munnar um, as, as a scholar, as a PhD scholar at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, will be presenting his, one of his recent papers. So with that, I would uh, ask Mara to, to begin. Um, the format of the session is perhaps the same as before. We'll keep around 15 minutes of time for each panelist, and then probably come back to the discussion based on what you said. All right. Off to you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, you, uh, thank the organizers of the, this workshop and just to sort of uh, echo Dipanshu's words, uh, it's been for me, who am not, I'm not very familiar with the Indian context, it's been like a very, very rich uh, afternoon so far, and I've learned so much that I, I think my head is a little bit, so you forgive me if I'm not uh, making much sense. Uh, so uh, my work has primarily focused, as, as Dipanshu was saying, on um, uh, the special practices of, of street vendors and in the city of Belo Horizonte, Brazil. I'll show you in a few minutes where the city is. <laughs> uh, I've been interested uh, in my research in kind of challenging this formal informal binary. So it, it talks a lot to what 
the discussion in, uh, in, the, in late in the morning was about. So um, instead of like looking for informality or formality, I'm interested in looking at these economies, which I somehow I sometimes prefer to call popular economies, and um, and the forms of living of those who are engaging in, in these activities. Um, and I'm particularly interested, uh, and in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the relationships between these local economies and the global economy, right? And uh, especially in terms of the relationship between Brazil and China, and how uh, those relationships affect uh, this uh, this particular local economy that I'm looking at. Uh, initially, I was I was invited to, to speak at the migrations panel, but because of my own mistake, I had a, I had a double booked myself. <laughs> I I was sent to this one, but I think actually this perhaps is a better fit for uh, what I'm going to talk about today. So um, the area that I'm focusing on is the city center in Belo Horizonte that looks a lot uh, like that space that you can see in the picture. Although those workers that you can see that they have the right to be there because they are, they are selling handcraft goods. Whereas the, the street vendors that I'm particularly interested in are those that are mobile street vendors that uh, are mainly selling products made in China and uh, that don't have the right to be on the urban space. And uh, we're going to see in a minute why. So um, just to kind of like um, open up the discussion a bit and connect with what was the discussion in, uh, late in the morning, uh, this is a, 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 a quote from one of my participants who is a, a councilwoman and a social activist in Belo Horizonte that works together with street vendors and to help them uh, in their political struggle for accessing urban space. And I think her, uh, uh, um, what she's saying really summarizes the reason why I'm interested in looking at street vendors. So she says, the world today is experiencing a trend towards labor precarity. People are living under constant pressure and such pressure affects pr productivity, leading people to search for quotidian alternatives, bikus, what we call in Brazil, which are part-time jobs, and for working extra hours to make, just to make ends meet. So I think that unions have never paid attention to street vendors which have historically existed much earlier than such tendencies towards precarization. However, now everybody must rethink labor from the perspective of those who are excluded. I believe that this is one of the potentialities of street vendors. So this idea that we are experiencing a crisis of labor that I think uh, you're going to talk about in your presentation and that street vendors have been historically facing that crisis for, for a long time. So they are an interesting group to look at. Uh, so this is uh, Brazil. The Minas Gerais is, uh, is the state I'm, I'm talking about, and Belo Horizonte is the capital of, of Minas Gerais, which is that door on the, on, on the map. Uh, uh, Belo Horizonte was a, a planned city, uh, but it, it grew out of its plan, like normally happens. And uh, the actual planned area is that, that central area you can see in the map on the, on the right, uh, whereas the, the, the whole map is the, the actual city, which has around uh, uh, 2.5 million people, which for Brazil is, is quite big, but I guess for India, not, not so much. Uh, this is uh, the, the original plan so, uh, of, the, of the city that was inaugurated in 1897. So it's recently kind of, a, it's a recent city. It doesn't have um, um, uh, such a long history. And the area that I'm going to be discussing more closely, it's what we call the hypercenter which is an area that uh, initially, when the city was planned, was uh, kind of um, supposed to be catering for middle class and to have like uh, uh, commercial activities more catering to those, to those kind of people. But uh, when the city kind of grew, this population, especially the upper middle class, moved south. And this area became uh, more popular in the sense of like uh, not only of being crowded, but also of catering for more uh, low income class people. And it's a transportation hub, so it's a place where street vendors uh, uh, especially um, uh, um, enjoy um, uh, selling their goods in because it's, it's a good spot, right? You have uh, uh, um, uh, people all the time to, to just uh, sell the products. So uh, because of this, uh, uh, this sort of overcrowding of this, of this area with this uh, popular commerce, 
Uh, in, the, the, in the end of the 90s, uh, uh, the government, the local government started to uh, uh, discuss a plan to revitalize this, this area. So revitalize here under quotation marks because it means basically it was a very alive space but not, just not with the kind of people that, that they would like to be there. So uh, and I don't know if you can see on the picture uh, that's on the, on the left side, it's like how they lose to look like. So this sort of stalls with street vendors selling all kinds of things. And on the right, you see the after pictures with, which are like basically empty spaces, right? So uh, in combination with this policy, they also approved a, a municipal law that, makes, that made the unlicensed, unlicensed street vending illegal. And, uh, and relocated uh, a, a portion of those that were acting on public space to uh, uh, shopping, uh, popular shopping malls. Uh, and with those that remain on the street, um, the state implemented a sort of zero tolerance policy and not really allowing those uh, people to, to, to be there. This is like uh, uh, how the popular malls look, uh, look like. And, um, and, I mean, to begin the story here in terms of like how I'm relating this to, to, to China and to Chinese uh, migrants more specifically, um, um, a, a big portion of the products which are sold in these popular markets are imported from China. And more recently, not only you see products from China, but also Chinese people. Uh, and, this, uh, and whenever um, uh, my, my intention with this talk is was to explore a bit this, this kind of um, um, uh, discussion about this Chinese mig migration that I've, I've heard a lot in my field work since the, my doctoral research, people talking about Chinese migrants and how they were taking over uh, this, uh, this popular economy. And um, I've never really done research with the Chinese migrants myself, so that's why um, the talk is more like of the perception of Chinese migrants and how they've affected the, the, this local economy. But the, the, this popular shopping malls, with time, uh, uh, basically what happened that rents went up, and uh, those street vendors with uh, with uh, low income selling the products, the cheaper products were unable to remain in those in those popular malls. And uh, with the the, 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 the the arrival of Chinese migrants, a lot of them uh, took over uh, stores in this in these malls. And those that could not uh, uh, remain in the popular malls and those also that became unemployed more recently because of the of the economic crisis in Brazil, especially after 2013, uh, returned to the streets. So you have like this kind of claim what I'm calling here, quiet encroachment of the streets, right? People coming back slowly and setting up like this more improvised stores to sell uh, um, petty commodities to, to people uh, walking around in the streets. So in, in, in theory, you had like the restrictive laws still, uh, uh, this uh, is street vending is still illegal. But because of the economic crisis and the inability of the state basically of, of dealing with this, uh, Throughout from 2013 to 2017, there was a sort of like uh, a discretionary action of special agents. In the pictures, you can see uh, the, the the guys in blue um, uh, on the top right. Um, they are actually the inspection agents, and they are by, side by side with a street vendor and doing nothing, basically because um, it, it it was somehow tolerated, although it it was illegal. So with the situation, they decided to again revitalize the center once more in 2017. And the story very, is very similar. It's like this same idea of including uh, uh, street vendors in the labor market. So some sort of like formalization uh, going on here, an idea of inclusion of the street vendors that would uh, become uh, entrepreneurs and uh, somehow formalized. Street vendors were not uh, happy about this uh, because the, 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 the policy uh, didn't really um, um, address their issues and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And um, they had like a, a, a conflict with the police which was uh, quite actually ugly uh, because they were not willing to leave but eventually they were part of those that were acting, that were selling their goods on public space in the city centre were relocated to this to this uh, popular shopping mall. And um, so the idea here is that this would be sort of some sort of social inclusion, right? By, by giving uh, street vendors a space in this 
in this uh, popular shopping malls to, to become then uh, formalized in a way. Um, just So in practice, this is how it looks like, the, the, the shopping mall, because uh, most of the, the street vendors either did not move there or move and eventually left this spot. Because as I would argue, that what this policy does is actually just to impose a spatial order. It doesn't really formalize street vendors because they are still, in terms of their labor rights, in terms of their social security, just as precarious as before. And here they have to work from nine to five and confining those spaces and they are used to being mobile and uh, also used to uh, working f in flexible hours that can accommodate better their, their life strategies. So, um, so there, here you have like this sort of um, um, uh, movement emerging that sort of this, this movement for the right to work on the street, which I'm kind of arguing here that it's not a demand for a proper job. It's a demand for inclusion, but not on the terms of what we would call formality. And it kind of highlights the centrality of this, t this street for, for urban lively livelihoods. And also kind of brings this political struggle of the ambulances or mobile street vendors to the fore, right? Uh, so kind of like going through the, uh, uh, sort of getting to the point of, of the, the, the Chinese involvement in this, uh, I'm going to look at uh, like how the role of identity in the way that street vendors shape their, their claims. And I'm joined here for the, from the work of, uh, of Veronica Crossa, yeah. who did work on Mexico and street vendors, and she talks about this politics of difference, which is how street vendors sometimes they evoke this uh, difference, they differentiate themselves from all the street vendors in order to claim access to urban space. So um, we are better than them because we sell uh, handcraft goods or because we are Brazilian in this case. Um, uh, so uh, in terms of this, uh, in this movement, uh, uh, this political struggle that emerged, I've met this very interesting guy who, was a street, who is a street vendor since he was a kid. He told me a bit about his trajectory and he has an interesting uh, nickname. His nickname is uh, Shanghai. And I asked him, why, why do you have this nickname? And he said that it's because he has like slightly, he, the shape of his eyes make people think that he's Chinese or has some Chinese heritage. And also he has a lot of Chinese friends. And, and he met this Chinese guy 20 years ago. And because of this good friend, he made all the Chinese friends, right? And um, in this conversation that I'm having with him, he eventually, without me asking, he starts talking about what I'm calling here the Chinese effect, right? So he says, this process begins around 2003, 2004. Uh, then there was the arrival of the foreigners, a trend that has been increasing. People often say that there is an economic crisis in Brazil, that we are experiencing an economic crisis, and that this economic crisis influences consumption and employment. But if you look closely, the main driver of the global economic crisis is China, with very cheap products, very cheap labor, and such. This has triggered a series of consequences, not only in Brazil, but around the world, right? So this is a very well-informed street vendor, as you can see. Uh, so, I mean, he's absolutely right. So Brazil and China have this uh, uh, very strong uh, relationship, uh, at, at, especially in the 2000s, right? We can see that Brazil's recent growth trajectory after the 2000s was mainly driven by uh, exporting commodities to China. And uh, especially the economy of the state of Minas Gerais, which is based on minerals, has benefited a lot, a lot from this uh, relationship in the short term. But in terms of for the long term, uh, this competition of cheap industrial goods has actually affected uh, local industries and caused damage here and deindustrialization, not only in Minas Gerais, but in Brazil. And um, um, when commodity prices went down, Brazil started experiencing an economic crisis and then growth of unemployment and growing inf informality connected to that. Um, and these changes in the global economy have also brought changes more specifically to this popular economy. So as I, I talked before, in this uh, um, uh, uh, sector that I'm looking at, there is a prevalence of, of made in China products, right? And um, um, in the late, until the late 90s, products would come from China via Paraguay. So you have this kind of China, Paraguay, Brazil, Sao Paulo to Belo Horizonte uh, uh, kind of uh, trajectory, which is exploring the work of uh, Pinheiro Machado as well. Since the mid-2000s, there's this new wave of Chinese migrants to Brazil that kind of uh, changed this, uh, the way that this trading network uh, works. 
So uh, Paraguay was kind of out of the equation. And because Chinese people had relationships with, with uh, Chinese exporters in China, they were able to uh, bypass Paraguay and import goods directly to Brazil. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm going to conclude. <laughs> uh, so and also eventually, uh, although the majority of the migrants come to Sao Paulo, some of them also came directly to Belo Horizonte. So you have actually this direct link between China and Belo Horizonte. So what, what did that, uh, that did to this local economy is that this kind of local small wholesale shops that used to sell the products to, to, to the, the street vendors were replaced by the Chinese people. Right? And they uh, have a very unfair type of competition with street vendors because they sell directly to uh, consumers as well. So for the street vendors, they buy a piece that they would buy, uh, as a normal person would buy, buy 10.50, they buy a 10. And then nobody wants to buy from them at 11, for instance, because they can afford to buy at the store for 10.50. So that creates the problem for them. And also in terms, just to conclude, uh, it also creates some sort of, um, uh, I'll say, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, identity-based crimes, some sort of xenophobia among the, the street vendors that uh, see as an unfair situation that uh, this invasion of foreigners uh, that took over the, uh, the, this, this local economy they, they used to operate, uh, and uh, they've seen them treated uh, unfairly in relation to Brazilians, which are facing this kind of uh, daily challenges to access urban space to uh, operate in this, in this local economy. So just quickly to finalize, uh, what I want to say here with this story is like, first of all, uh, call attention to this porosity between formal and formal. So we see that this local economy is very much connected to global circuits of capitalism. And not only in terms of the circulation of products, but also in terms of the circulation of bodies or circulation of people. Right? And in terms of the, how that affects the everyday life of the street vendors, we see this emergency of identity-based claims, claims and this politics of difference. Um, um, and yeah, that's it. I hope that was <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Do you feel that the same effect that you saw uh, here is being resonated in Rio or Sao Paulo as, as a, as a mechanic, just on your own observation in terms of what you define as the Chinese effect? There, there is work about about uh, this particular effect for Sao Paulo. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not particularly, uh, I don't know about the case of Rio. But I would say Rio must have a similar uh, situation in relation to Belo Horizonte because most of the Chinese migrants actually go to Sao Paulo. Yes. Right? So um, uh, some of the street vendors, for instance, still go to Sao Paulo to buy the goods. Um, but I can, I can uh, forward you, yeah, like, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, there is literature on Sao Paulo. Great. OK, please, after this. OK. <coughs> so good afternoon, all. My name is Laknath. My name is Laknath Jai Singha. <coughs> I'm an associate professor in marketing here at uh, the business school, JGBS. I'm vice dean of research, overseeing the research activities in our school, and I'm also associate director of the Centre for Indian India Australian Studies, based out of the law school here at uh, JGU. So, I come here today sort of wearing a couple of hats. The first hat, well, the first obvious hat is as a marketing prof in a economics development studies workshop. <coughs> and I'll explain a bit about that in a moment. Uh, the second hat that I adopt here is an Australian, um, talking about Australian gender, shifts in Australian gender norms, 
and some of the implications for consumer behavior. Uh, I was born in Australia, raised in Australia, um, lived pretty much all my life in Melbourne. Uh, for the last four years, I've lived in that beautiful city over there um, called Sydney, which uh, I hope some of you will have a chance one day to experience. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before I'm a marketing prof, and my methodology, my training has actually come from cultural studies. So I take a cultural approach to examining marketing, in particular consumer behaviour. And when I say a cultural approach, I really actually examine <coughs> consumer behaviour through the lens, or a couple of lenses, but mainly through the lens of cultural anthropology. So I sort of style myself, if you want to put it that way, um, at conferences and so on as a consumer anthropologist. My main locations to date of study has been have been the Australian suburban home and um, and within the, the home I look at things like advertising, engagement, product use, what's the meaning of brands within the contemporary Australian home. More recently, or I should even say about 15 years ago, I actually started my research career looking at gender, gender in Australian popular culture, but sort of put that aside, that was through my master's work, and put that aside whilst I um, pursued my doctoral studies. <coughs> and recently I've come back to gender, and I find gender fascinating. Gender, gender constructs us, of course. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is very early stage research, and I really do, I'm actually throwing this out there, and I'm glad we've got people like Mara and uh, Kabiri here as well to sort of tap into some of the ideas, and obviously from many of you here, because what I'm doing in, what I'm going to be presenting is some very early stage research around some, a project or a couple of projects that I'm sort of touching on at the moment. And really, it's looking at where, uh, where is this idea of gender right now in 2019, 2020, with regard to two contexts of Australian consumer behaviour? So let's get started. Um, I mentioned two con contexts. The first is I'm going to look, talk about this idea of institutional, institutionalised paid parental leave. And, and again, I, I guess that sort of touches one of the themes of today's um, uh, workshop, which is around the idea of work and the nature of work and, and so on, and I'm sort of giving a, a gender twist to that and where are we, where we, when I say we, I mean Australia, where are we as a nation with regard to that and some of the implications for consumer behaviour. The second is around this idea of same gender marriage or what many people would call same-sex marriage, um, same-gender marriage, which in Australia was legalised at the end of 2017. And some of the uh, ideas, not just stemming from that, but that's sort of like a pivotal point through which I feel I might, in, in, you know, with my research, talk about some of the ideas about um, urban space built around gender tropes, in particular <laughs> what might be the implications for, um, if we call it, for what a uh, better word or better phrase, what might be the implications for gay urban villages, gay ghettos, gay consumer cultural spaces. So I'll talk about that uh, in the second sort of context. So let's sort of get started. So, the first area I want to focus on is this idea of paid parental leave, which is a major, major, major issue in Australia right now. Um, if you, 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 know, you open up our daily press, the Australian, the centre-right newspaper, or the uh, Sydney Morning Herald or the A in Sydney, or the <coughs> Melbourne Age, the centre-left papers, uh, paid parental leave will grab the, uh, the attention, the, the sort of, uh, on a daily basis. 
Um, and the sort of discussions have been going on for more than I've put up there since 2011, but really for the last two decades, uh, formally introduced in Australia in 2011. Uh, and I guess the underlying gender model, gender framework was that it was largely focused on maternal pay. Right? So it, it still assumes that there's a male, masculine, male breadwinner model uh, and the, uh, the, the female will be uh, the one who will be you know, left at home to rear the children. Um, <clears throat> In 2011, the basic allowance was, uh, well, sorry, currently, introduced in 2011, and currently the basic allowance is 740 Australian dollars a week, and currently it's available as a um, formal government um, program for 18 weeks. Right? So employers or can, can dip out of work and get, um, uh, get this basic allowance for 18 weeks. More recently, as a result of pressures from the Australian, um, from the Australian um, population, suggesting that it's not just the female, bread, uh, the female who's at home ch uh, rearing the ch children, it's actually the male breadwinner as well. And so in 2013, the Australian government introduced what they call dad and partner pay. But you can sort of see the, uh, the pay is actually a government uh, initiative for only two weeks. Two weeks of pay at the same uh, basic allowance of $740. But whereas paid maternal pay is for 18 weeks, paternal pay is actually just for two weeks. I'm sort of contextualising that and juxtaposing that against this other trend, I guess, that has been developing over in, in many developed uh, economies over the last decade and a half, and this is that of the stay-at-home dad, which in defiance of the official government allowances, we are seeing, and these figures here, stay-at-home, um, as AHD, um, stay-at-home dads, from, uh, has increased, the numbers of these dads has increased over the last decade from 68,000 to roughly 80,000. Uh, that was the last time data was collected on this in 2016. So we're seeing an increasing number of working dads staying at home, choosing to stay at home. That might be forced or it might be actually by choice where the uh, female partner may actually have more earning capacity. But in any case, we are seeing an increase in the numbers of whom we call stay-at-home dads. This has led to this development of research over the last three to four years examining this phenomenon. Right? And um, currently, the great bulk of that research focuses on, as I put there as my last point, the project of cultural legitimation. You know, what happens to these men who are at home and what... How do they attempt to <coughs> build some sense of cultural legitimation uh, when they take a, a masculine status hit for staying at home? In Australia, there's not, um, you know, this is a typical Aussie dad from uh, a, a newspaper uh, article that came out this week. You know, you can sort of see a very middle, very, very middle class Australian family. <coughs> the great bulk of the research, as I said, currently is looking at this idea of how do um, male breadwinners attempt to culturally legitimate their activities. And mainly the, the research comes from uh, the, the uh, area of family studies. Um, there has been a, hasn't been a great amount of research written from within my, my field, consumer research or marketing research. However, there is a seminal article from 2013 written by two uh, quite prominent researchers from the US, um, Gotcha Kuskunabeli and Craig Thompson, that looks at this idea from within an American context. I'm just going to talk through some of the ideas and put them out there and we can discuss them later on 
Um, <coughs> so what they found was this is uh, research from the uh, from published in 2013, data collected from 2009 to 2012, and what they found was that stay-at-home home dads um, through their consumer behaviour, and when I say consumer behaviour, I, I, I mean not just consumption and purchasing, but also practices around um, the notion of consumption as well. What they're on about really is this quest to develop legitimacy around their, you know, if you want to put it, subordinated cultural, domestic cultural capital, stay-at-home dads. And what they do they do a couple of things. Um, they try and convert this subordinated domestic cultural capital into economic capital through practices of thrift, maybe in sh through their shopping practices and so on. And this is very different from practices of thrift that we see with female, uh, you know, female grocery shoppers. This is practice of thrift really about uh, elevating their sense of domestic masculinity. Um, <clears throat> the second uh, uh, practice is to convert this, these levels of uh, subordinated domestic cultural capital through to elevated levels of social capital by aggregating, by sort of um, aggregating themselves into various support groups and online networks and structures to discuss their, if you want to put it, subordinated masculine position and what they can do, to, you know, in terms of everyday tactics and everyday practices to legitimate themselves in the in in their everyday lives. The third is to tie these both, the economic cultural practices, social capitalising practices, tie them both into this idea of, to develop this idea of symbolic capital. And this is really around trying to develop some sort of cultural legitimacy around what they're doing. Um, this might be through practices of DIY, DIY do it yourself, technology, you know, uh, using iPads and tablets and so on, whilst calculating the shopping at a, at a very, very local level. But what this serves to do is elevate them so they're putatively meretricious, their you know, diminished um, sense of cultural capital and give them some sense of legitimacy. So that's sort of like the first context I want to talk about. The second context so I'm just going to skip this. This was a beautiful diagram, but I, I just for time's sake, I'll skip skip that. The second is actually to talk through another arena through which um, gender and gender norms are shifting in Australia, and this is through um, it's. I've just put there the legalisation of same gender marriage, but what we're actually talking about more widely is actually a broader community acceptance of same gender relationships as the third bullet point there says. So I'm just going to skip through just for time's sake, I know I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, <clears throat> at the end of 2017, uh, as a result of uh, 15, 13 years of uh, political activism, uh, cultural activism and, um, and um, general uh, and a general community broadening of the uh, acceptance of homosexuality at the end of 2017 um, the Australian government passed uh, a reform to the marriage act and that was on the basis of a nationwide what we call the postal survey in which roughly two-thirds or 60 percent should I say of the, po the nation agreed to the idea that uh, same gender marriage should be legal in Australia. Now that comes on the back of wider, as I've put there on the third point, wider community acceptance of same gender relationships, which is very different from if we travel back two, two decades in, in the country. 
this has led to some sort of normalization of this idea of LGBT culture, cultural norms. And what I'm interested in here as a consumer researcher are the implications for this well, and what we might call gay consumer culture, what we might call the gay village, the gay ghetto, the gay consumer space. <coughs> a couple of headlines uh, from our recent press. This is from 2011, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald talking about Melbourne's gay <coughs> consumer precinct. Has Melbourne lost its gay precinct on Commercial Road? Uh, that was a former, for the last three decades, a former gay strip, which is now quite barren. Uh, and the article suggests that it's the, you know, the, the increasing normalisation that has led to the, um, well, I guess the lesser need for formal venues to socialise and uh, aggregate around. Uh, this is Sydney in uh, Oxford Street. I don't know how many of you have been to Sydney and Oxford Street. This was the former gay strip, if you want to call it. Um, more recently in Sydney, there's been a series of discussions. This is from 2014. Uh, routinely, there are discussions like this in our major press around what's happening with these formerly politically active spaces and what's happening in terms of the, the retail um, frontage for these spaces. Oxford Street now has, uh, I think I read today, a 40% for lease vacancy rate. Right? So from a formerly thriving strip to a strip where there's now a 40% uh, occupancy rate, people are trying to work out what's going on. What are sort of some of the formative um, cultural bases for these um, <coughs> for the, the the vacancy, if you want to put it, uh, out of Oxford Street? Part of that, I would suggest, is part of that I would suggest is, as I've said, uh, the normalisation. Uh, another part of that is the legitimation of what we call the app culture. Um, you know, there's no need necessarily for the social and sexual networking that goes on in public spaces like bars and clubs and ca cafes, for example, if you can work that through apps, for example. Um, I'm going to leave it there just for time's sake. I'm getting some wrap-ups from... Um, <laughs> the, so we can talk about some of the broader... Exactly, some of the broader circuits. I, I noticed that Mara mentioned before the circuits of global capital before... Um, the ideas of the global and local which I had intended to also bring in here but we can sort of talk about them as they might reflect what's going on in these two um, contexts that I introduced. So I'll leave it there and uh, hopefully we can talk about some of the issues in a moment after. I think that this is probably the most disparate panel you... I, I don't know how you're going to weave yeah, together that's, all that's our presentations. Sometimes that's, that's the point, please. please. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm an anthropologist, so it's very unusual for me to show you statistics, but I'm going to break my mold. Um, I, I'll just run through this very fast so that we don't do the, you know, tennis head uh, thing. Right, uh, so uh, very quickly, a very broad context uh, to my work. I wrote a chapter uh, um, which was published uh, mid-2019 with a colleague in, uh, in Geneva uh, in the ILO Centenary publication on the future of work. So this is a bit of a broad, broad context. Is this, the, is this a uh, first class? Yes, okay. Okay, so so this is uh, you know the the data on actually formal employment, those of uh, those in the formal economy. So you can see that uh, in 1991 it's uh, about 80 percent, and then uh, in 2017 we come down to uh, below 80 per uh, you know 80 percent of self uh, sorry um, slightly below uh, 80 percent of uh, self-employed workers. 
and a slow increase in uh, wage and salaried workers of total employed population. Uh, the next slide. Um, here you look at uh, the manner in which there is obviously a fall in agriculture. This is a trend that everybody's talked about. It's about 43% uh, right now. So you see uh, from about 60% to 2017, it's gone down. And you have an increase in the services, obviously, in 2017, it's uh, almost 40%. Uh, uh, but once again, there are problems with this. Next. Um, no, yeah, OK. So here you see uh, the percentage of the dark ones, the percentage of total population age, uh, this is what I, I mentioned in the morning, age 15 plus, which are employed. Uh, which goes from about 58% in uh, 1991 to uh, about 52% in uh, 2016. And then you see a percentage of total population aged, that is the you know, working age population, 15 to 64, which is rising at the same time. So it's about 50, uh, 58% to then to 60, almost 62%, 61.9% in 2016. Uh, next, okay. So, so this is a, a part of our work was looking at employment in technology, and I will come to it at a later point of time. Just very quickly going through the slides, you see, uh, uh, 2012 to 2015, you see, uh, you know, kind of a stagnation in employment in technology, despite all of the talks of a boom. You see a boom actually in 2013. Uh, and then in 2016 and 2017, you see a rise, but this, this uh, is not really a rise. It's because the data points changed. You had 2,000 to 3,000 establishments which were surveyed in the uh, quarterly economic surveys, uh, sorry, employment surveys. And then in 2016, it was uh, revamped to include 10,000 plus. So you see, actually, this, this allows you to see the manner in which there is a real tampering also of that. It looks like as if there is a lot more employment in tech, but there actually isn't. Uh, if you were to, uh, you know, control for the numbers, uh, which is which is not possible with this data set. Okay. So yeah. So this is uh, also again once again a part of our article where we are looking at online labor and we're looking at the manner in which technology work is shifting from companies such as Infosys and Wipro to uh, online labor platforms. Uh, and, and that's really the bar you see, the green one is creative and multimedia, then you see clerical and data entry. Uh, the pink one is really the most important. And you see India uh, and, and a large part which uh, provides software development and technology. Next slide. And then you see uh, the global share of uh, online labor uh, is really in uh, India, in the, the, the largest uh, share of online labor uh, is being provided by India, primarily the, the software development and technology, but also in the other domains. Okay, so now I'm, I'm going to kind of tie in some of these statistics with, with some other work that I'm doing uh, with a colleague of mine in the Institute for Research on uh, development, Isabel Guerra. Uh, if you look at all of these statistics, they really bode very badly. I mean, the first one uh, was really formal employment. You're not looking at informal employment, and then in the informal em employment, there's already uh, you know, there's a substantial amount of stress on informal employment, as as uh, we spoke about in the morning. Uh, but um, yeah, if you look even at formal employment, you have the falling. Uh, female labor force participation rate. So you are again uh, in a situation where women are in a certain sense retracting from the economy. Uh, if you uh, uh, examine, for instance, the case of information technology, and if you look at, for instance, you know, the, the fall in technology work along with this increase in so-called online, uh, um, online uh, work, uh, then you can kind of correlate that a good number of the jobs that are actually being performed in the technology sector, the small minute coding and that kind of job is actually being moved to online labor platforms. 
Um, if you look at, for instance, if you read the work of Karel Upadhyay and um, Hari Priya Narsimhan in IIT Hyderabad, you realize that there's a gendered aspect to technology work, uh, which means that uh, increasingly, uh, you know, the management work primarily is very male dominated and you have the lower end coding small bits of work which are done by women. Uh, and if you look at the changing trends and the transformation of the IT industry, you can very probably safely say that a good amount of this work will be off shelved into online, uh, online labor platforms and a good amount of the workers, it's the female employment in the IT sector will probably move to doing these kind of jobs. So this has real questions and implications because then it means that uh, you are in a certain sense precaritizing a certain uh, a particular uh, group of technology workers. Now this is on, the, on what you call the middle class uh, educated group of people which I honestly don't deal with, my, my interests are <laughs> with people like uh, you know the the, the group that uh, that you are talking about. So I'll come to that now. Um, if you're, uh, uh, you know, my my work primarily has been on urban poverty and the politics of the urban poor. I've looked at women within this large arena, you know, which are women are generally absent from politics. You know, if you see um, virtually, but also in academic studies, we literally invisibilize them. So my attempt has been to, in a certain sense, visibilize women within the politics of the poor. Uh, you, we, we are in a very broad context where increasingly uh, what you see is work is reducing. At least this is the manner in which I look at it. On the other hand, you have an in increased role of the state. The state is, in a certain sense, assuming a very paternal role, uh, providing uh, what, you, uh, what Nitin mentioned as social welfare benefits, you know, the larger, the doles. Uh, you're either giving, uh, you know, um, handouts in different forms. Um, you are, in a certain sense, uh, making people dependent on you. The state does that, right, through various kinds of schemes and programs. And this ties in with my PhD work where I saw uh, on the ground in a very large rehabilitation area in, in Bangalore that a good number of women actually do not want to go out to work. May many women actually even retract from the workforce. Uh, primarily because they spend a lot more time these days and increasing an amount of time accessing dole, state dole, you know, welfare benefits. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, concepts that me and my colleague Isabel uh, are working on is really the concept of political work and with this I will very quickly wrap up, I will not take too much time. Uh, you, when we think about politics, we really think about it in terms of social moments and people who are organizing uh, amongst themselves and time and resources. Even within social moment theory, you talk about it uh, in a very fluid sense. You don't really think about it in terms of work. Uh, but if you look at the, the changing nation, uh, nature of the state, the neoliberal state, which is not really completely retracting, it is in a certain sense becoming more of a provisioning state on the one hand and at the, on the other hand is making, making the environment extremely difficult for people to do what they earlier did. Uh, then you have these communities in a sort of a position where they have to choose what they want to do, you know, and do they go out to work or do they find it far more beneficial to stay back at home and spend a good amount of time accessing uh, what is freely available, you know, many of these things, it could be a pension card, it could be, uh, you know, BPL benefits, many of these things actually make more sense to women uh, than to men because they provide, they're, they're also provisioning material, they're not, it's not money that you earn from the state, you're not getting uh, PESA out in the market, but you're getting what you really need to sustain your family. Families, and if you looked at the role of, if you primarily look at the role of women within families, they play a dominant role in provisioning much more than in income generation. You can tie it in a little bit with the older trends where women do the kitchen gardening and take care of the household expenses, and the men go out there and earn the cash. You see a sort of a similar trend taking place in urban poor areas, very large areas where women actually stay home and take care of the water situation, the electricity situation, 
manage all of these tiny little uh, things. Now the concept of political work, we, at least the concept that we hope to propose, is to look at this sort of political organization because to access these resources, you need a certain political you know, uh, organization. You can't really go to the state and get it very easily. It takes a humongous amount of time, resource, efforts, energies, organizing, mobilizing. So we've, you know, we are developing the notion of political work to think about politics not necessarily in the restrictive sense of uh, something that you do uh, to access something politically, but also a form of work, uh, primarily within the neoliberal context. And we are hoping that can, in a certain sense, explain why women are attracting from the labor force. That's